Hey guys, what is up? Steven here to do another Patreon video for you. Uh, I know I said last time I was going to be doing stuff on Wednesdays, but it, you know, it works out for my schedule better to do it on Mondays, so I'm mixing it up a little bit. Um, I did also say last week that I was going to be kind of alternating between film breakdowns and top 10 lists of prospects. And so uh, my last breakdown was Elijah Vera Tucker. That kind of started my process of wrapping up the offensive tackles in this class. And I think it's it's really is a deep class. There are a lot of high quality second, third round options uh, for the Chargers. And I think there's a good top tier as well. Uh, so we're going to get into that today. Uh, and then next week, I'm thinking about maybe doing a, a breakdown on a receiver, maybe a, a cornerback kind of uh, mixing things up a little bit. Uh, although I am in the process of wrapping on my edge rusher. So uh, that could be a possibility as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, like always, this will be private and exclusive on Patreon for one week. Uh, and then next week it will go on YouTube for public. So make sure you're watching this. Uh, you want to be able to sign up for our Patreon if you're not already and, and be able to get exclusive access to these videos. Okay, so that being said, um, let's get started with my top 10. I'm going to start with number one and, and work my way down for 10 because that's, I think it's a little more suspenseful that way. Um, sorry about the lighting. I don't know why my, my camera always does this, but uh, first and foremost is Panay Sewell, the offensive tackle out of Oregon. I think some people have gotten incredibly nitpick, nitpicky about him. And when you look at like how he compares to Rayshon Slater, uh, who is my number two, obviously Slater is a little more technically refined. He's older and he has more experience, right? <laughs> and so um, really that's like the difference. Panay Sewell, when he was starting games, was 17 years old at Oregon as a freshman uh, and then 18 and 19. And so you know, he just is about to be 20 years old in the fall, which it, it, there's a lot of crazy upside there because he is so young and he's so athletic. You know, I said this on our show this morning. If you build, if you went into a laboratory and you built up the perfect traits for an offensive tackle in the modern NFL, Panay Sewell would walk out. He's got incredible footwork. He's got incredible strength, incredible grip, incredible punch. And he's the best athlete in the class. He can do things at the second level that nobody else in this class can do. Uh, and so I think if you're nitpicking Panesol and you have him number two, I just can't agree with that, man, because I think part of ranking prospects is the upside portion of things. I'm not saying like, you know, I'm moving people up in grades ahead of someone just because they have a little more upside. Like, you know, you look at my receiver rankings and I have Dev Fitzpatrick and he might not have – uh, the the highest upside, but I, I think he's a, an incredible, incredibly well-rounded wide receiver. And so that's just to say like Panay Sewell, he is well-rounded. He's not as well-rounded as a Rayshon Slater, but, you know, I think he's so much more athletic, so much more physical and just has better traits. And so Sewell at number one for me is a no-brainer. Rayshon Slater at two, Again, a no-brainer. I think, you know, Rayshon Slater, he's so versatile in the way that he wins as a pass blocker. And that really is the difference between him and everybody else in this group is his ability to be a very technically refined player. You know, he can win with a two-handed punch. He can win with a one-arm, one long, one arm, long arm. He can win with his feet. He can be patient and beat you with leverage. He's so smart. He works angles and he wins in every single way possible as a pass blocker. As a run blocker, some people have, have said that he might be better suited for guard um, just in general. But I think as a run blocker, he, he does lack the kind of strength to really push people off the ball. And so for me, I think it's it, he can play anywhere, but I think his best place is as tackle just because he's not like the strongest run blocker. And I think if you're going to use him in an, as an effective run blocker, it's got to be in his outside zone scheme where he can get to the second level uh, quite frequently. Like that's where he's going to make his heyday and that's going to be on reach blocks uh, on scoop blocks and, and getting able to being able to get to that second level. Um, you know, as a guard, you're often the one who takes over when you do a scoop block. And so you have to be able to have the strength to push people off the ball. And, and I just don't think that's his game. That's a little, again, a little nitpicky, but that really is the difference in in how i see him as a tackle versus a guard okay number three for me is elijah vera tucker i said this one when, um, when i was breaking him down i love his game as a guard or as a tackle for me he would be right behind landon dickerson as an interior offensive line he's number three 
as an offensive tackle. And some people have said, you know, he's been a guard most of his life. This was his first year starting. He only started six games at left tackle. And I just don't care. <laughs> like when you have an experience, it doesn't matter if you're great at things. And that's the thing is like, he was so, so good as an offensive tackle. And could he be better as a guard? Sure. That's possible, but I'm going to let him play at tackle first before I move him into guard. And, you know, again, there is some flexibility there. If I'm choosing between, you know, signing Alejandro Villanueva and drafting Elijah Vera Tucker, then sure, I would play him at guard. But if I'm choosing between signing a top tier guard and playing Elijah Vera Tucker at tackle, like that's what I'm going to do. And so I think he offers you a lot of versatility, a lot of upside. I love the way that he works to the second level. I think he is the most efficient second level blocker in this class. The way that he gets to linebackers and safeties is just incredible. Uh, I don't think he's the best athlete, obviously, behind Sewell. And I do think the next guy on this list is a better athlete. Um, but he's very smart, very aware. And as a run blocker, like the difference between him and Slater is that Vera Tucker is strong and he can blow people off the ball as a guard and as a tackle. And so um, this this one, uh, he's not I think the difference is athletically Slater is a little better. But Vera Tucker is stronger, and I think he has that ability to push people off the ball that Slater doesn't have. Okay, so uh, that's my top three. Those are the three players that I would be thrilled with at number 13. Obviously, I don't think Penesal is going to be there. I think Slater has a chance to be there, um, but Elijah Vera Tucker is like my number one focus right now at pick number 13. He gives them so many options. Uh, just a big fan of his game and his versatility. All right, next on the list is Samuel Cosme out of the University of Texas. Tyler and I had a really good conversation about him versus Christian Derrissaw. I just think Samuel Cosme, his athletic profile, his length, and really just his urgency and aggressiveness puts him over the next few guys. And I think he is a work in progress. He does have a little tendency to play down to the competition, which uh, I understand, you know, that's a big knock for some people. Um, for me, just the athletic traits really outweigh the negatives. Um, I will say that because of those concerns and because of his struggles with consistency, it does make him a higher risk player as well. So I think the reward here uh, is outstanding, but it is a higher risk. Someone compared him to Garrett Bowles, who I'm very familiar with as a University of Utah alumni. Um, and I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair comparison in terms of athletic traits and the high risk, high reward aspect of things. Garrett Bowles has obviously figured things out. Now he's one of the best left tackle, left tackles in the sport, but it took him a little bit. It took him a while to get there. Uh, granted, you know, Garrett Bowles only played two years of college football and Sam McCosney has started at the university of Texas for three years. So a little different situation, but I think the idea of being a high risk versus high reward, I think that idea does hold weight with Samuel Cosme. All right, so uh, number five on my list, wrapping up the top five is Tevin Jenkins, the right tackle from Oklahoma State. I do think he could play left tackle, um, but I think his skill set and his aggressive nature would hold more weight at the right tackle position. Um, I think he is bar none the strongest offensive tackle in this class the way that he just bullies and pushes people around it is a, an ability second to none. He can blow people off the ball. He can blow people, uh, blow people. Yikes. Um, <laughs> um, but he really is the strongest offensive tackle. He's got an incredibly strong grip. He can hold people down. He gave Joseph Osai a ton of problems. Uh, and same with Ronnie Perkins and really all these high quality edge rushers out of the big 12. Tevin Jenkins just had his way. He's such a strong blocker. Um, I think that, you know, his, he's not the most mobile player, but because of his strength, because of his technique and because of his aggressive mentality, I think he is a very safe player. Um, but again, you know, for the chargers, I think that fits a little awkward unless you're, you are signing like, an, uh, you know, a Alejandro Villanueva, Taylor Moten or Trent Williams in the best possible case scenario at left tackle, then you're drafting Tevin Jenkins too. Uh, play the right tackle position next year after Brian Balaga is uh, cut or retires. So that's my top five. Christian Derrissaw is number six. Uh, and I get why people like him. He is mobile and he is aggressive and he does have some very intriguing physical traits. 
but for me, it, I don't want to say he's lazy. I don't want to say he's lax, lackadaisical, but he just pays at, he just plays at a slower pace uh, than the other guys. And that's okay. You know, if it's, if that's how he plays, if that's, if he's able to stay in control and do the things that he does, that's okay. It's just for me, you know, when I'm looking at a top tier offensive tackle, I need to see that urgency. And it's just not really something that I see out of Christian Derrissaw. I did do a full uh, player profile for him at, at LEFB if you want to check that out. Um, but I, I just don't see the urgency. I, I see the strength. I see the power. And I do see the positives. He does have a first round grade for me. So it's not like I hate him. It's not like I'm, I'm you know, placing him, you know, in the top 15. Like he is obviously, you know, he's number six. Like he does have a lot of upside, a lot of great traits that I would be thrilled to get him at 13 because it does signify that the Chargers are investing in the offensive line. I just would prefer the other players and, and hopefully that makes sense. I'm not trying to knock Christian Derrissaw. He is a very intriguing player. And again, I do, I do think that he does merit a first round selection and a top 15 selection just because he does have athletic, high quality athletic traits and he plays left tackle. Like that's the bottom line. Um, it just wouldn't be my first choice. So next on the list is Liam Eichenberg. Uh, I had him higher than Jenkins and Christian Derrissaw, um, but just like learning more about the position and, and watching him on film, you know, he's not crazy athletic. He's going to be a very solid starter, but again, you know, weighing upside versus grade, I just don't think that he has the athletic profile to be like an all pro perennial pro bowl kind of tackle. Um, again, very solid. I think he'll, he'll always be in like that top 15 at his position kind of player, you know, very similar to like Alejandro Villanueva, but you know, Liam Eichenberg, I think he is a little over reliant on his two handed strike. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but when you're talking about like winning at a high level at an offensive tackle position, you need to look for players who are more like Rayshon Slater, who can win in a variety of ways. You know, it's very similar to a pass rusher. If you see a pass rusher who only wins with speed, speed to power rushes or just speed rushes, then, you know, it's a little bit of a concern. And I think Liam Eigenberg is that way. He's inc incredibly well-rounded. He's a great run blocker. Uh, I don't think he gave up a sack at all this past season or the season before that. So very consistent, very well-rounded, but just his athletic upside, uh, it's not there in comparison to these other guys. So um, he is, he is number eight for me, or wait, I'm sorry. Number seven, number eight is Dylan Radunes. And this Dylan Radunes is my last first round grade at the offensive tackle position. Um, I get that he's a smaller school guy, but he's so smooth and he's such a high quality athlete at the position. He gives you everything that you could possibly want. Um, he does need to add some weight to his frame, especially some people have, have said that he might be best suited to play at guard immediately and then switch to tackle after he develops and get some uh, water under his legs kind of situation. And I get that. But overall, I think he is such a smooth athlete in pass protection, and he really has all the physical traits that you want. And I don't really care that he played at North Dakota State. You know, you look at like Ali Marpet. Uh, and all these other guys who come from small schools and have had great success in the NFL, it's just not really a concern anymore. Would I have loved to see him at Notre Dame, Texas? Like, sure, obviously, but, you know, he's a great prospect, and he went down at, at the Senior Bowl, and he was the best offensive lineman out of everyone there, and that includes Alex Weather Leatherwood, James Hudson, you know, Deontay Smith, Creed Humphrey, Trey Smith. Like, everybody was talking about Dylan Radunes and what he did uh, against those edge rushers, and I think he's an incredibly – well-rounded player i just think he does need to add some strength and, and weight to his frame so that's my end of the first round um number nine here is going to be alex leatherwood which is crazy right like he was the offensive lineman in all he was the best offensive lineman as voted by his peers and writers in all of college football last year as the outland trophy winner um i, I do think he could be a high level starter he does he has great length he, he is very physical it's just the ability as a run blocker really like it, it kind of concerns me a little bit. He's not somebody that when he works inside that will push people off the ball. If he's doing outside blocks and, and 
you know, pulling from his tackle spot to the perimeter, he's great. But that's half of what you do as an offensive tackle in terms of run blocking. Like you have to be able to work the inside. Uh, and I just don't see that. But his hand placement is a little inconsistent as a pass blocker. But, and, you know, he does have the tendency to lose against speed rushers, which Quincy Roche gave him a lot of problems down in Mobile. And, and Roche is obviously a speed rusher. So I think he's a very solid player, but he, he's not somebody that I'm like, uh, dying for the charges to get, you know, I would much prefer obviously any one of these guys or even the next ones who have a little more upside. Um, but Alex Leatherwood is number nine. Um, so my last one here is James Hudson, the tackle out of Cincinnati. Again, he does have some concerns. He's only played one year at the position. He was a former defensive tackle, but he's a, an incredible athlete, which he showed again in mobile and throughout the season very aggressive tackle and so there is some good and some bad to that like you would rather see someone be over aggressive than passive but you know he is going to have to clean up his technique similar to Liam Meikenberg right like he prefers to win with a two-handed strike and he's got an incredibly strong strike but he's going to have to diversify his package against NFL rushers and some people said he is 6'4 but he does have long arms so some people have said he might be best suited at right tackle I don't disagree with that um, but I think James Hudson is going to be one of those players similar to Samuel Cosme, although to a smaller scale, that's very high risk, high reward. You take him in the second round and hopefully you have a high level offensive line coach who can bring out the best in him and continue to develop him. And I think he could be, you know, somebody that we're looking at as one of the steals of the draft, just because he's got that kind of upside, but, uh, he definitely is a little more of a project than anyone else in this top 10. So that is my top 10, Panay Sewell, Rayshon Slater, Elijah Vera Tucker, Sam Acosmi, Tevin Jenkins, Christian Derrissaw, Liam Eichenberg, Dylan Radunes, Alex Leatherwood, and James Hudson. Uh, if you agree with the list, uh, please let me know. If you don't, let me know. I'm, I'm all for the positive feedback and having some discussions. Um, guys who just missed the cut, Walker Little. Again, one of the toughest evaluations to really get a feel for. I had to go back and watch some of his tape from his freshman and sophomore seasons. But, you know, back then people viewed him as a future top, top pick. And, and I can see why it's just, there's so much unknown there because he essentially hasn't played in the last two years. But um, in terms of a second round pick, somebody that could come in and, and sit for a year and develop and have that, you know, really high upside. I think Walker Little fills and checks a lot of those boxes. Uh, Jackson Carmen, the tackle out of Clemson is next on my list. And then Deontay Smith, Brady Christensen uh, are also some honorable mentions that I think will be some players who could be very solid starters at the next level. So again, make sure if you're not subscribed to our Patreon page, uh, I will put that in the description on YouTube. Make sure and do that because you get all these videos exclusively for a week uh, before it goes public on YouTube. Otherwise, make sure and like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you guys so much for your support. I love doing these videos, love talking ball. Uh, and like I said, please give me any kind of feedback that you uh, feel is necessary. I'm, I'm open to all the comments and, and, you know, just trying to better myself and, and help inform you guys as well. So that'll do it for me today. And I'll see you guys next week.